Good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all. This is the uh, Tuesday morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee. Uh, we're going to start off uh, first thing uh, with the bill that has been sent to our committee, S338. It's a justice reinvestment bill. And we have Representative Emmons and Representative Shaw joining us. And we may have another member from their committee joining us to uh, do a walkthrough of this bill. When we're completed with this bill, we're going to move right back to uh, trying to finish up our work on the uh, transition quarter year budget. We're really close. And um, this afternoon at 3.30, we've been asked to uh, do a presentation to the caucus of the whole with as much as we have, the, with as much as finished. And then we could finish up on Wednesday if needed, but if we're lucky, we may be able to just do it this once um, this afternoon at 3.30. So we're here from 8.30 to 10.30, and then we're coming back from 1 to 3, uh, and then on the floor at 3.30 for the Caucus of the Whole. So let's start um, with our first item on the agenda. Uh, welcome, Butch and Alice, and um, who is going to do the walkthrough of your work on the Justice Reinvestment Bill? I think the best way to start, Butch is going to be doing, for the record, Representative Alice Emmons, Chair, <clears throat> Corrections and Institutions. Um, I think for the best thing to do is start with Butch. He's going to do a quick walk through the first <clears throat> couple sections of the bill that deal with internal operations of DOC. If mm -hmm. Kirk comes on, there's some report back corrections <clears throat> towards the back of the bill. And then at the very end, there is the appropriations section. And we picked up the appropriations section that came out of the Senate Judiciary Committee as a place to start the conversation. Um, <clears throat> part of this recommend from the Council of State Governments is to put in some initiatives to work people quickly through the correctional system. But the real um, next step of the Council of State Governments is really working on the community systems and behavioral health in terms of trying to reach these savings that the correct the, the justice oversight, I mean, not justice oversight, but the council of state governments projects over the next five years <clears throat> in order to get those savings and reinvest those savings, there needs to be some upfront dollars put in this next year in terms of beefing up our community systems. And that's what the appropriations section in the back of the bill attempts to do. So I'm going to shift over to Butch to give a quick walkthrough of presumptive parole and furlough and good time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so, so uh, we have the bill up in front of us. Okay, uh, welcome, Representative Shaw. Uh, thank you, Representative Toll. Uh, uh, Representative Butch Shop in Pittsburgh, for the record, uh, sitting here today in front of you with S338, a bill we received from the Senate that has been in the works uh, from uh, that derived from some great work by a, a committee of folks, uh, Justice Reinvestment Committee uh, that met over the summer. Uh, you may remember last year's Capitol bill authorized that meeting and asked uh, them to work with the Council of State Governments in, uh, in, in taking a look at our correction system and see how we can do better work. Some of you may remember Justice Reinvestment One that happened in the mid to late 2000s, uh, where we uh, saw that our incarcerated population was uh, creeping uh, upwards you know, with some projections that we would have about 27 or 2,800 people incarcerated as of today. Uh, by instituting the changes in, in as suggested in JR1, uh, our population is down somewhere around 1,500 today. So we're looking at that we're calling this Justice Reinvestment 2 because it's time to take a look and see what we're doing, and we did. And so the bill before you uh, talks to those some things that we could do to further uh, reduce our population uh, that's incarcerated and, and some under the control of the commissioner thus saving money of about, uh, it's projected savings uh, from 11 to $14 million by, by year 2025. And that's cumulative savings 
uh, by year 2025 in the Department of Corrections uh, should this, uh, uh, this bill uh, do what it's intended to do. Uh, and I think you'll hear, and I know you'll hear from the chair at the end of this bill, why uh, that, uh, re remember the title of the bill is reinvestment. So we need to reinvest some funds to make sure that this all works so we get payback at the end of the process. The bill is very technical, uh, and but I'm and I'm just going to talk about uh, three of the major sections of the bill. One is the first uh, piece of that: the findings and the purpose of the findings and the purpose, and you can read those at your leisure. Uh, we're going to talk uh, section uh, two forward talks about uh, parole. We currently have a system of parole, but we expand it uh, to a presumptive parole, where where our inmates uh, after they serve their minimum sentence are presumed eligible for parole uh, and that uh, uh, and that's that happens in these sections and the technical ways of getting there are in the sections and I want to point out that in these sections we do a, a, a rollout of the system so we don't overwhelm the uh, the parole board and the community super community services that are currently available we start with uh, uh, non-listed crimes for a year uh, or two, and then we move up to people that might be available that are serving uh, time for uh, uh, listed crimes, the more violent crimes. We never uh, uh, allow people serving time for what we call the big 12 crimes, which are typically crimes against, uh, against people to be eligible for presumptive parole. We move through parole into the furlough sections, which uh, starts uh, in section eight uh, of the bill. We currently have furlough. We currently have somewhere, nobody can tell us exactly how many furlough statuses we have currently or substatuses, but it's somewhere around 20 and maybe more. What we're doing here is reducing that number down to three uh, different types of furlough. Furlough is a, a status of people that are uh, placed into the community, but still under the supervision of the Department of Corrections. Basically, it's, exp it's an expansion, extension of the, uh, uh, of the prison walls into the community. And these folks are on a pretty tight leash. Uh, and I'll, I'll back up just a quick for parole. The parole folks will be underneath the supervision of the uh, parole board uh, backed up by the DOC. And that status is a, is a little more liberal and is more successful than actually uh, people out on furlough. And through the furlough piece, it's, it's very, very technical on how you get there and what happens if you do or don't. And uh, and that in, in sections, uh, as I said, uh, section eight uh, forward. And then we get uh, to the next big piece of the bill for me is the, is, is the good, good time. And some of you who have been here a little longer than others uh, may remember good time. Uh, that was revoked back in the late or mid to late 2000s because it was too cumbersome to keep track of people received uh, days off their sentence uh, for various uh, rewards uh, that in things that they needed to do while incarcerated. And that proved way too cumbersome and it proved a problem with, uh, with truth and sentencing. And we did pass a good time bill. I think it was S-119 uh, last year authorizing this. We did ask at the time for a, a group of folks that help us determine who should be eligible for good time. Uh, they came back to us this year with some recommendations and this, uh, this section <clears throat> is a lot of current law, uh, but it, uh, it does allow uh, people uh, that are currently serving time to receive good time going forward from the date of passage. Uh, and in that section there, again, it's very technical and, and allows, uh, it gives us the rules and the terms to follow while people are in good time. Butch, like is the, Butch, Butch, can I interrupt you? I'm, I apologize. Is there a good time section in this bill that we that Teresa needs to get us to because we were still on section eight? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sure, that's up in section 14, Teresa. Okay. Um, okay. Just just so that we can follow along with the language yep. uh, because Teresa scroll to get I'm, there. Okay. I'm sorry for going a little bit too quickly. I forget we're, we're on Zoom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there we go. Okay, up on section 14. Uh, that's the good time section uh, in this, uh, uh, this, as I said, it's, it's pretty technical, but it allows offenders to, to, to earn uh, seven days for every, uh, every month that they uh, 
subscribe and prescribe to the uh, conditions that uh, this, this section uh, uh, lays out as how they earn this good time. Uh, and then what I'd like to point out here, and I, I think that's where I was when, when we uh, determined I was going away too fast, is that, uh, that we, have, we have taken into consideration victims uh, and victims uh, services all the way through this bill so that the folks that were the victims of these these people's uh, uh, crimes understand what's going on and what's happening and give them a voice in any hearings or let them know what's going on with uh, the perpetrator of the crimes against them. And then we get up into uh, some escape language, which is some, some language that just some cleanup language. And then that's it for me on the, on the bill and transitioning to uh, uh, Representative Taylor, who I see is on now, to talk about uh, section uh, 19 uh, going forward. get started I will take care of the section that deals with the appropriations which is the last section okay thank you Alice uh, yep. welcome representative Taylor it's good to see you thank you uh, so we are starting on section 19 with you with racial disparities right okay. uh, well it's probably uh, I wasn't quite here but it's probably it's been mentioned the, the whole bill comes from recommendations by the Council of State um, government's justice center. And so the goal is to ground those recommendations and future recommendations on evidence-based research and practices. So to further that goal, um, S338 sections 19 through 23, they propose ongoing work and report back from agencies and work groups. Uh, there's probably about a half dozen different reports. Uh, there's not only a Check back, check back on the effects of S338 statute changes, but also investigations into racial disparity, data collection, probation, parole, furlough policies, as well as future steps. So I'll go through those very briefly. There's quite a few, but you'll see that it's a pretty comprehensive look at our criminal justice um, system uh, for not only the present, but for future changes. So section 19 uh, explores current data and um, identifies additional data to analyze racial disparities in Vermont's criminal justice system. So this is a panel and a group of people working on that. Uh, it's particularly important in light of national events now to look into our, uh, ra any racial disparities within the criminal justice system. Section 20 is a report uh, on the burden of the new presumptive parole system portions of the bill. It looks into those primarily to see what the effects is on the, whether there is any administrative burden in the record keeping of that and, and how it works. Section 21 continues the work of the Justice Reinvestment Working Group, kind of keeps it going, reestablishes it and gives it a whole bunch of new tasks to uh, about nine different tasks. And they are uh, those nine, uh, it, it's, I'll be brief on each one, to use the Agency of Human Services information to determine deficiencies in inmate screening procedures, assessments, case planning, and propose solutions to any deficiencies they find. It also in there to investigate offender risk factors and how they can be used to target, target appropriate services and treatments. The idea is that you was, we try to do services and treatment based on the risks of um, recommitting crimes or a risk to the public. So they wanna make those risks targeted towards specific treatments and services. And so that's being investigated. They're also supposed to figure out how to share data among the various stakeholders of the reinvestment group about risk assessments and treatment programs and to better inform um, plea agreements, sentencing, probation revocations and decisions along those lines. So the idea there is to better collect data and share that data among the people making decisions about sentencing and treatments and things. 
They're also going to study probation and how it might be better or a kind of a default to incarceration uh, when there are appropriate community supports. Further, they'll evaluate a program whereby a probationer might receive credit on their sentences for time served on probation. This was part of the original proposal to, while you're on probation and you're serving time in the community, actually, you would get credit on your sentence. We really battled that one back and forth and finally decided that it needed more research and uh, considerable more thought. Also, the group will explore additional probation options uh, whereby an offender might have their probation reduced or terminated under certain circumstances. And finally, uh, they'll evaluate S338's addition of an appeal process uh, for some furlough returns or revocations. That's also a, a controversial part of the, pro of the proposal that we thought needed to be looked at uh, more in the future. And so we're having them take a look at it. So by mid-January of 2021, the working group uh, must report on nearly all of those things I just mentioned. And uh, that's kind of, I believe, a preliminary kind of report. It's not the final report on all their work. They'll continue their work. And by mid-January of 2022, the working group will kind of wrap up their work with another report and any legislative um, changes that they might have developed. And they're also going to be looking into, looking into funding for any future work uh, that they might do or someone else might do. There's a couple, about two other reports in section 22 uh, by December 1st of the year 2020, this year, that's coming up pretty soon. The Agency of Human Services is to provide information to the working group on mental health, substance abuse, and behavioral health assessments and how they inform case plans and care of offenders. And finally, section 23, by mid-January of 2021, there's to be a report, uh, the Department of Corrections will report on how to strengthen DOC's policies regarding rewards and punishments and ensure that they follow uh, best practices in response to violation violations of behavior. That's another uh, thing that came from the Council of State, uh, the Council of State Governments to use more and different incentives, both positive and negative, and have that better understood and implemented. So that's section 23 and the end of the reports, I believe. Thank you, Kurt. And um, we're going to move, Alice, you're going to pick up this piece now. Yes, the appropriation piece. This is section 24. And as I said earlier, we picked up, we just picked up the language as it came out of Senate Judiciary Committee. <clears throat> and this is an attempt to really beef up our community systems. One thing that's really clear from the Council of State Governments is that for this uh, next step, which you see in S338, for this to be successful for our uh, offenders, they really need more support once they're released back out into the community. And we need to do some initial investments in order to reap those projected savings or avoided costs, whichever way you want to phrase it, in the future. And so the Senate came in with a $2 million appropriation. Um, 400,000 would be for risk-based domestic violence intervention program. A million would be evidence-based transitional housing uh, programming. And the remainder, which would be 600,000, would be for evidence-based programming for offenders transitioning <laughs> back into the community, which could include like workforce development or other community reentry supports. Um, the intent back then, this was done in beginning of February, end of January, beginning of February, which seems like about three years ago. Um, it was the intent that these would come from one-time funds um, that would be available through FY21. So we did not want to lose the thought of doing some initial investment upfront in order for our initiatives to be successful. If we don't do some type of funding at the beginning, 
we're keeping the status quo in terms of when offenders re-enter into the community. <clears throat> there is not enough support systems out there. And what council state governments is really highlighting and will continue to do their work. This is <clears throat> what Kurt alluded to on the working group working with the council state government governments over the next few months is really looking at the behavioral health and support systems within our community. And I'd really like to emphasize that the Department of Corrections is within the Agency of Human Services. And for folks who are part of the corrections system, they themselves or family members may be under other <clears throat> parts of the Agency of Human Services, be it Department of Mental Health, be it Department of Economic Services, be it um, under Dale, and let's have a coordinated approach to these situations. And in conversations with the interim commissioner of corrections, uh, Commissioner Baker, he feels quite strongly that we need to beef up our community systems in order for positive outcomes for our offenders. Because currently what's happening is just not successful for our offenders. And also the public sees um, <clears throat> when an offender is not abiding by the rules or they lose their housing or they lose uh, their programming for substance abuse or they um, lose their employment, they blame DOC when it's much more systemic than that. So this is an attempt to at least start the conversation on the appropriations piece and hopefully put some money up front so that this becomes a successful piece of legislation. And that was our thinking. It's a starting point for discussion and a placeholder for you folks to figure out in this COVID world about the finances. Thank you, Alice. Um, committee members, uh, do you have questions for either Representative Shaw, Emmons, or Taylor? Uh, Dave? Yes, thank, thank you. Um, first, if I could ask Representative uh, Taylor a question and then the chair a question. Um, Representative section 22, number one, please. Let me see that, let me go back. That can't tell you the exact page number, but I'm coming up to it here. There it is. Um, do you see it, Representative? It says- Section yes. 22, section 22, Dave? 22-1, yep. Section okay. 22. Okay, there we go. Yep, um, thank you. Um, it says the nature, it'll be a report, it says the nature and scope of available screening and assessment of mental health and substance abuse needs and how the uh, assessment informs case plans. Um, just because uh, I'm assessed and screened doesn't mean I get the treatment, does it? And is not whether I got the treatment more important than whether I was assessed or am I missing something? No, um, no, just because you're, you, the screening is kind of universal in many of these cases. When, when somebody comes into a corrections facility, they're screened um, and they're also assessed for mental health and things like that. The question is, uh, we want to make sure that those are used appropriately and to target the treatments with it and services within the community. But it doesn't mean that they won't necessarily get it. They're screened to see whether they need it and they're assessed to see whether they need it. But the, some of these things have not, it, we're trying to make sure that those screening and assessments do actually influence the treatment um, and the services that are available. I, I, that's uh, logical and rational. I just didn't see the words and I assumed that was happening, but I wasn't sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, sure. Yep. Yeah. And now, uh, Chair Alice, if, if I may, um, a couple of different questions here. Do, do you know, um, do, do you know the caseload ratios or staffing pressures on the probation staff? Um, um, what's what's uh, typical and what's not. I know many people have come out, uh, rightly so, uh, of prison uh, during this pandemic period. 
Um, it, and, and where I'm headed on this is that I'm making, and I shouldn't, but I'll at least identify it. I'm making the assumption that the greater my case loads and the need, to, uh, the, always the pressure to make sure the public are safe, if I'm concerned about you, I'll violate you on a technical uh, violation just to make you, uh, uh, to incarcerate you again. And that's one uh, less worry that I have about keeping the community safe. Does that, does, is that what drives a lot of the technical violations? And, and if caseload ratios were different, might that be different? Does that make any sense? It does, and it's a very complicated answer. Uh, caseloads and ratios are dependent in terms of the risk assessments of the offender and also the seriousness of the crime. We put in some caseload ratios in statute 10 years ago that if, you, if a parole op probation officer, field service officer has some very high risk offenders under their caseload, they have a much smaller ratio. And for other situations where the risk is not as high, then those particular field service officers would have uh, a higher caseload. So it really depends the person they're supervising, what their risk factors are, and also the seriousness of the crime they were convicted of. So the caseloads are different. In terms of technical violations, when an offender um, is released under furlough, furlough is an extension of the corrections facilities walls. They are still incarcerated. We, we have this particular status of furlough that other states do not have. Most states have probation, which is under the jurisdiction of the courts, incarceration, which is under DOC, and parole, which is under the jurisdiction of the parole board. We have a hybrid where the furlough, you're still incarcerated. Just the walls have been extended out to the community. And you have limited freedoms. And the offender agrees to those conditions of their furlough. So when there's a technical violation, it could be they shouldn't be going to a certain bar or they shouldn't be going to a certain neighborhood or they shouldn't be using alcohol. And then there's a violation of that where they're going to a particular neighborhood. What happens in most cases is the field service officer will um, say, okay, you're gonna do this this time. We're gonna put you on an electro electronic monitoring bracelet. So we'll give you another chance. And then they violate again. They may instill a two day stay in a correctional facility and let them out. So there's different variations in terms of those technical violations. And whether or not they would use that to say to the public, hey, we're really strict here and we're gonna violate them and yank them back into corrections so that you feel safer. I think that's a real conversation on an individual basis that you really need with field service officers in terms of their jurisdiction. And that, that's hard to answer as a legislator because it's a case by case situation. I, I appreciate that. Madam Chair, may I just have one more follow up? Yes, you may. Yep. Um, uh, Alice, um, do you know the work that will be done in the community? It speaks to transitional housing for a, a piece of the uh, uh, appropriation. Um, I, again, I shouldn't assume. Do you know if an effort has been done to see if we could match global commitment to pay the staffing necessary for the ongoing follow-up uh, of the uh, folks, uh, the caseload? Um, there's a lot of the work seems like rehabilitative uh, therapy in a way. It's it's much more uh, once they're once they're put in, the, in uh, under community um, uh, services. Do you know if we've ever tried to do that before? I'm not aware of that, but that's that's what we really need to look at. We need to look at bringing more partners to the table here for an offender that's reentering, and not just look to DOC to provide all those services. Do you know who they'll subcontract out to? They would, you know, they could subcontract out to a facility that's run like Phoenix House 
or Dismas House. Other parts, you know, Pathways, they do quite a bit of supportive housing. Um, I know the Justice Oversight Committee heard testimony back in November, I believe. And I think part of that $1 million that the Senate put in was to go towards expanding pathways in other parts of the state. What we're really looking at is a wraparound service uh, right. for the tender. And it has yes. to get away from DOC's budget. Correct. That's where the that's, matching opportunities might be, but thank you. I'll follow up on that. And thank I think you, you also have to check if the offender has insurance in terms, when they're under furlough, if they would qualify for Medicaid. Because once mm -hmm. they're incarcerated, they lose all their insurance coverage. Yes, yep, I was thinking once they weren't incarcerated, but thank you, thank but you very much. But that's an incarcerated sentence, so I don't know if being under furlough. Gotcha, Go gotcha, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Alice. Um, Kurt, did you have some clarifying information before I move to Marty? Sorry. Uh, yes, I just wanted to add um, that there, in, uh, in addition to what Al uh, Representative Emmons said in, re in response to um, Representative Yacloni's question about the uh, uh, furlough and bringing them back, there is uh, Section 23 does include a report um, done by DOC that will look into that sort of thing and the whole incentives and um, use of those. So that's part of the, of the proposal. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. <clears throat> Marty? Yes, my questions are regarding the appropriations. You described three different areas where you would concentrate the money, uh, domestic violence, transitional housing, and community support. You've given some examples of the transitional housing uh, I'm curious what kinds of, can you give me details or examples of the kinds of programs that you would use in the domestic violence and the community support areas? Are these just extensions of programs that are already out there? Are you looking for new kinds of programs that might affect persons differently? And who's going to define what those programs are? and then how you would distribute this $400,000 and $600,000. First off on the 400,000, I think some of it would be under current programs, but also if you look at the language, it's really for risk-based domestic violence and intervention programming that would be certified by the Vermont Council on Domestic Violence. And, um, I would think there would be, we didn't take specific testimony on any of this. This was done more in the Senate Judiciary Committee, but it's to really look at risk-based violence, domestic violence. And they would be also, the network would be giving us an interim report in terms of what progress that they have made. So I'm assuming that some of this will go to current programs and there might be also some new programs for this. Um, also, in terms of the uh, transitioning back to the community, um, the remaining 600,000, those could go towards um, possible workforce development. It could go towards your community justice centers. It might go towards diversion. It would look at what's currently in place, but also do we need some specific programs that need to be beefed up in terms of looking at risk and evidence-based? Because what the council state governments found is that folks may need some particular programming for their risk, but DOC doesn't provide that specific programming. They may provide a program in domestic violence, but it may not be specific enough for that particular offender's needs. So they would put that particular offender into that program and it might help the offender and it might not. And what was limiting DOC in providing those specific programs that were needed was budgets. DOC's budget is not flexible enough or it's not enough to provide those individual programming needs that are really needed. So let's also look at the community for some of that. Does that make sense? Yes and no? Yes, it does. And, and But the, these, these appropriations are to further programs that exist or, or create new programs. Do we, what do we anticipate in terms of longer term um, 
expenses. Would would you anticipate that all of this extra emphasis on programming would need to continue in the future? I mean, this is a one year appropriation. It's a one year. Uh, would we be needing this money? It, it, it depends. Yes and no. When we have done justice reinvestment in the past, we did, as Butch mentioned, justice reinvestment one in the 2008-2009. We, we initially put in some money to, be, to get some programs going. And then once the savings were achieved in bed savings in DOC, those saving dollars were then replacing the initial appropriation that was put in. So it's the savings that are incurred through these initiatives that are then reinvested. But in order to get the programs up and running, you need that initial investment, which is what's here in this bill. And if it and hopefully they will, okay. the programming will continue, but the funding source would be the savings in DOC budget from bed savings that they're not going to be shipping people out of state because that's where your bed savings come from is your contract for the out of state beds. Those are how that's how that's that's meaning that the DOC budget would remain stable. Correct. The DOC budget would remain stable. You're yes. just not spending on out of state. You're spending it on this instead. Correct, but okay. you're getting you. more, you're getting more bang for your buck because you're not spending sixty thousand a bed or thirty thousand a bed for an out-of-state bed. It's cheaper to do it on the community. Right, level. I understand. <clears throat> so, Alice, I just want to follow up on that. So, the savings would go into reinvesting into, into these uh, programs that you have outlined. Would there be additional savings beyond that that's anticipated uh, for the state? I don't recall council of state governments getting into that. Do you, Butch? Mm -hmm. I know they, they looked at that 11 to $14 million. They called it avoided costs over mm -hmm. the next five years um, in the DOC budget for that because the folks would not be taking up a bed. <clears throat> and that's true, Alice. Uh, over the next five years, uh, if we saw a 20% reduction, uh, the savings uh, could be a cumulative total of uh, 11, <clears throat> uh, 11 to 14 million in it and, and averted co costs uh, to DOC. So as, uh, as you said, uh, this is a reinvestment. Uh, so uh, if, if we reinvest those savings into community services, I believe we get way more bang for our buck than yes. just having Yes, people, I appreciate uh, that, yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Butch. Um, we have Mary, Diane, uh, Marty, were you finished? I don't know. Marty, were you? Yes, okay. Uh, Mary and Diane and Chip. Thank, thank you. Um, it's my understanding that the expectation is that any um, avoided costs or savings within the system will be reinvested into the system, not... <coughs> not creating additional funding that we could use elsewhere. And my guess is that, you know, maybe over time, but right now it's too speculative. We couldn't say, hey, let, let's take 20% of that and apply it somewhere else I mean, no. it, it, because it's just too speculative. Dave asked the question of um, whether or not we were using any global commitment money. And the answer is yes, we are, right? In the proposed budget back in a different time and world and place for FY21, was 821,000 in global commitment money to support the transitional housing. Um, so yes, DOC has already seen that they need to be doing that. And I assume we'll continue with, so we can maybe, we'll have to figure out how we gross up these dollars or you know how, how we manage that money. Um, one of the, the, the thing that I wanted to add to the conversation is that in my conversations with the commissioner of the Department of Corrections, and I think he's testified to this in um, 
in institutions and corrections is that they're really talking about um, two things happening within the department. One is a cultural change of, of how they're managing um, um, offenders. Uh, to Dave's point about revocations and sending people back, um, this commissioner is very focused on um, looking at, um, at managing folks in the community in a different way. And he has talked about the model that they've had in Rutland with what Project Independence and Vision. Project Vision. 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 And Project Independence is in uh, Barry in a whole different thing. Um, Project Vision, um, which really substantively changed the way they thought about um, offenders and the community and the relationships between all of the different programs. And so that's, that's what he's hoping to recreate in, a, in other communities across the state. Um, and then the last thing that I just want to throw into this thinking <coughs> is that under the pandemic, DOC is proving that this is possible, what, what we're talking about. They have reduced the prison population by about 300 people at its peak. And you can do the math on what you save by not having folks in, incarcerated. Um, and, and so there, you know, there, there's, I'm sure, some consequences <laughs> and some concerns about what that is what is happening in the community with that reduction. But if we keep putting the right supports around people in the community, I, I think we are proving that it is possible to do what this, this bill is proposing to do. So I really appreciate Corrections work on this. Um, it's a really significant piece of legislation. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Um, Diane and Chip, I forgot I was muted. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I totally agree with this concept and we've seen it play out and, and we've had conversations in our committee. It's very similar to the choices for care arrangement around. There's, you know, and, and, and same thing with uh, disabilities and community, community placement or uh, action. And we've seen that it's uh, has an economic savings for the state as well as it's it's a it's a better humane um, day to day living. It's all around good. So here's my question on this, and this is where um is it's going to be really important that there's language that structures the savings reinvestment. So I would really ask people to take a look at what is in statute by the choices for care mandated reinvestment of those savings and then how are those savings going to be tracked? So tracking those savings for their reinvestment is also going to be really, really important because it's a it's a, it's a yearly struggle even within our own to deal with um, those captured savings not being uh, lost to the yearly budgeting pressures. So um, you know, and it might doesn't have to happen in this bill, but it would have to happen maybe within the report that comes out um, in in the coming year or the update of of the work that they do of those nine nine reinvestment working group. Uh, it would be that would be my thought would be um, also to add that they include how are they tracking and by statute offering language to support that reinvestment savings are not lost. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Diane. You're uh, welcome. Did, did anyone want to respond to that? I, it wasn't a question, it was a statement, but... I think our committee would be open to that and it would be very helpful. Uh, thank you, Diane. Uh, Chip. Um, I, I'll be very brief. I, I just can't let it go without being said that when we think about the, the um, return on investment here, it, it's importantly about savings in the in the corrections um, budget, but it it also you know what we're getting out of this investment is much better and much increased programming for preventing domestic violence. 
which you know has the benefits that are obvious. We, we're talking about um, workforce development, which you know is good for Vermont as a whole, but also um, you know for the better outcomes for those people who are moving out of corrections in, and into the communities. Um, you know, the, just the obvious um, return besides the savings are just important to note here. And I um, just didn't want to let it go without being said. I think Chip has, has hit, hit it appropriately in that we really need to look at what outcomes do we want for our offenders and our communities? And are we be, being successful in achieving those outcomes? Thank you, Chip, and thank you, Alice. Um, Kimberly. This is sort of tying on with what Chip said, and I just would throw it in here. Getting to the workforce supports, we know that a lot of the programming that happens upstream within DOC is critical. And I know that there's been an effort in your committee to really look at what's happening with the women's correctional facility because of the constraints on that facility not being able to do all the programming. So I think, you know, I know that you're working on that as well. And um, I've attended a lot of the meetings over the summer that led to this bill. And I think it's um, really heartening to see it all come together. The only thing that just slightly catches my attention though is that um, there are quite a lot of reporting requirements, but um, you know, I'm not here to judge that per se, but that is just one thing that does uh, strike me. But thank you for bringing this forward. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Mary? I, yeah, to Kimberly's point, and I didn't see in scanning through the reports, uh, their meetings, their groups, and could, so there must be a cost there to that. And I don't understand, I, I don't see that broken out or how we're supposed to break that out. Can you help us understand that? Well, I know with the working group, uh, piece that with the council of state gov uh, council of state governments that's a continuation of the current work group um the there are four legislators on that work group there's two senators and two house members so there would be a legislative expense there all the other folks are doing that in the role of their paid job so uh there shouldn't be you know expenses per se for that. Um, in terms of the uh, parole, the presumptive parole, that is with, help me there, Kurt, I think it's with the courts or uh, with the parole board. Vermont parole yeah. board. So that's work that they would be doing. Um, and then the Agency of Human Services our data collection that's within the agency of human services so we didn't get down into the nuts and bolts of the money and the um, cost of that so it's a justifiable question um, i don't know if it would increase enough of their workload to have an impact on appropriations or operating costs so Alice, just to take those one at a time, the, the continuation of the CSG work group, mm -hmm. um, how, we need to break that down. How many times you're gonna meet, et cetera, and maybe we can take that offline. I don't know that the committee needs, wants to sit through all of that, but let's, right. somehow we need to budget that. Um, so maybe you guys could give some thought to what that ought to look like. Um, but and from what you said, the remainder of the work is for state agency folks. So this is the only additional cost that mm -hmm. needs to be worked out. Am mm -hmm. I right? That's my understanding. Even the racial disparities. Um, you know, they're working with the Racial Disparities Criminal and Juvenile Justice Advisory Panel and the Executive Director of the Racial Equity, the Superior Judge, Attorney General, um, and they would be working with a crime research group. 
Oh, so I don't know if that might trigger something. Yeah, would we have to pay for that? Service? For them, yeah. Um, and then you're involving the sentencing commission in that too. Um, the sentencing commission is ongoing is my understanding. House Judiciary did a lot of work on the section dealing with the racial disparity and the sentencing commission piece because Representative Lalonde is part of the sentencing commission. So they changed this section quite a bit. In terms of the working group with the council of state governments, you know, in this COVID world, um, I don't know how many times they would meet. We met last year, probably six times at the most. Um, I don't know in this world if we would, we certainly would be doing it by Zoom so you wouldn't have travel expenses. You know, that's right. You would have the per diem, but you wouldn't have your travel and meal expenses. It is. Is that something the small group of corrections or maybe judiciary people could tell us what, what we need to budget for? Could you, could you guys, I mean, we, we don't know. I don't know what, how many times or whatever. So could you make a recommendation to us? Um, in terms of the racial disparity, I think that would be a conversation with the House Judiciary Committee to see what they have envisioned. Um, in terms of the work group of the Council of State Governments, um, I would reach out to the Council of State Governments and see what their thought is, because they would be using that work group as a real check-in in terms of the work that they're doing. And, and, and so at this point, Mary, you have the corrections budget. I would circle back with Maxine and her committee yeah. and, and get the number of meetings and also determine yeah. if it's a, a fee or a cost for the group. Yep. Okay. Because we, we don't, we're not going to be able to hash it out here without judiciary at the table. So if you could. Yep, we'll do. Then we would do an amendment. <clears throat> we could um, offer an amendment um, on this bill to. Um, to identify what those costs would be. Thank you for bringing that uh, to our attention. Dave? Excuse me. Uh, uh, just an observation. If assuming they serve 106 to 135 people, um, let's say the middle of that mid range that is 120, with a $2 million budget, that's 16,000 plus uh, spent per person, which is a lot less than what the cost of it incarceration is cost it might be higher than that because as mary said if we are able to match medicaid that goes up but i'm wondering my question though does the department uh, they must have but i worry um, um the administrative capacity to manage this um they won't be getting any do they get a piece of admin do they get like eight percent of this is any conversation of that and then finally was a two million dollar figure based on, you know, we can, we've can we done this in the past for 16 to 20,000 per person. If we can serve 100, it's 2 million, et cetera. Or was that just based on a, a round figure and it's a, a, the wisdom of the experience or around the table? So does that, the department have the capacity? Where did the 2 million come from? <laughs> well, the department will have the capacity, either you got to house them in a correctional facility or you work with your community partners for that. Um, and, and, um, Alice, I don't mean to interrupt, but you mentioned before that the commissioner weighed in and supported the bill. Yes, yes. Okay. He, he strongly supports beefing up the community systems. He says no way are offenders going to be successful unless you beef up those community systems yeah. and bring in our other partners. So in, ter in terms of the two million, that came out of Senate Judiciary Committee. So I, I am not sure exactly what their thought was. I think they thought that 2 million was something that they could do with the one-time money, that that would be the appropriate amount from the one-time mm -hmm. money. And um, they took it out, the Senate Appropriations Committee took this $2 million out of the bill when it went there and put it on their list for FY21 using one-time money. So we've picked up what House, what Senate Judiciary put in the bill originally, so we can continue the conversation 
here in the House and in your committee to see what are the appropriate appropriations and where should they go. Yeah, thank you. And we didn't want to lose that we need to do an investment in our communities up front. Yeah. Um, and when the commissioner weighed in on support of this bill, did he raise any concerns about the workload or, no. or, or any? Okay. No, no we didn't. A clear indication, but usually, um, usually if, if they do see an issue that is one of the first things that they raise it would be the impact of work on their department. But I, they think, I think it's more if we don't do these investments, the costs of DOC are gonna to continue to go up. Thank you, Alice. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Mary, your hand is, is that up? Oh, no, 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 sorry. Um, and so um, I, I think I'm going to draw this conversation to a close because we really need to get back to our quarter year bill um, if there's any further questions, uh, Mary has the corrections budget. If you would funnel your questions through Mary and she'll either send them out to corrections or to judiciary. We do need to find out what the costs are and um, with the work group and, and with the uh, one entity that would be consulting um, that CSG has recommended. And um, we also need to consider where we uh, might find these one-time monies if this um, is a priority of, of the legislature. And so um, if um, Alice and Butch, you could just weigh in on, on, on ranking this as a priority bill for us to consider at this time when uh, we're in um, such tumultuous, you know, the landscape isn't exactly stable. So um, if you could just give some reinsur reassurances, this has been brought before us of, of the priority level. One thing is that in the work with the Council of State Governments, <clears throat> there is further work that the, that the Department of Justice on the federal end can provide to the Council of State Governments and us, but they need to see the state taking a step forward in terms of the initiatives and some funding, some funding of supporting those initiatives in order to get the federal assistance. So that's the next step here. And that's why S338 is a priority and is so important for us to continue our work on the count with the Council of State Governments on this evidence-based justice reinvestment piece, because now we can bring in the feds, Department of Justice to help us. Thank you, Alice. Butch, did you wanna weigh in anything else? No, I think, uh, I, I think I'm done for now. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming in. Uh, Representative Taylor, thank you. Emmons and Shaw, it's nice to see Great. the three representatives from another committee. Um, we'll, we'll be seeing you shortly on the floor, probably at the 3.30 Caucus of the Whole. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.